Good day, ladies and gentlemen. And my name is Adrian Ang from the United States program at, here at RSIS. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the RSIS webinar, Nationalism, Ideology, and US-China Relations by Dr. Adam Garfinkel. Uh, before we turn to Dr. Garfinkel, there are just a few items that um, you need to be aware of. The chat and raise hand functions for Zoom has been disabled. If you wish to leave a question for Dr. Garfinkel, please click on the Q&A icon to submit your questions. And please note that if, should you leave inappropriate comments, it may result in you being removed from the event and barred from uh, re-entry thereafter. So without um, any further ado, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Adam Garfinkel. Uh, Dr. Garfinkel is the RSIS Distinguished Visiting Fellow, and he has also been the founding editor and the editor of the National Interests as well as a uh, speechwriter to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice when she was um, at the State Department. Um, the plan today is to have Dr. Garfinkel speak, speak for about 30 minutes, and then we will use the remaining time for questions and answers. So over to you, Dr. Garfinkel. Okay, I hope I can, hope people can hear me. Thanks, Adrian. Nice to see you, even if it's, uh, you know, far away. I'd say hi again to all my friends in Singapore. Um, I didn't actually invent this topic. Uh, it was invented for me, <laughs> but that's okay. I see these things as a challenge and find them interesting. Uh, but I have a couple of caveats to, uh, to start with. First of all, uh, for anyone to do this subject um, authoritatively and properly, you'd have to be something of an expert on both sides of the bilateral relationship. And I am not an expert on China. I'm not even an expert on US policy on China. And um, uh, so you have to remember that uh, uh, there's a limit to how much I can say uh, that's likely to be intelligible or worthy of paying attention to. But I will say this, just like sometimes it's, uh, it's noted by, by cognitive psychologists that you can see a star at night, a weak star at night, better out of your peripheral vision. Sometimes in subjects like this, people who are not inured to disciplinary orthodoxies can bring insights and at least raise, you know, better questions than some people who have been doing this all their lives. So there's a there's at least a, uh, an accidental chance that I might say something that might stimulate you that um, if you're an expert on this that you you haven't already heard. The second thing is it's a very capacious subject. I mean, uh, the topic begs some kind of definitional clarity. Nationalism and ideology are both very abstract nouns, and they're both loaded with all kinds of history and emotion they have meant and they still mean different things uh, to different people depending on their general orientation to political philosophy and as you many of you probably know the scholarly literature on both concepts on both nationalism and ideology is vast contentious and it's still developing um, so it would be a fool's errand uh, it seems to me to ignore definitional issues altogether before we get down to the you know the brass tacks of the Sino-American rivalry and what, what its nature is. So let me just say a few things about these two uh, very loaded questions. And let me start off, loaded terms, let me start off by, by uh, uh, invoking the name of Clifford Geertz, one of my favorite um, cultural anthropologists from days, days ago, days gone by, who said as follows, and I quote, although it is notorious that definitions establish nothing in themselves, they do if they are carefully enough constructed provide a useful orientation or reorientation of thought such that an extended unpacking of them can be an effective way of developing and controlling a novel line of inquiry, close quote. Actually, a novel line of inquiry is what I would like to do uh, tonight, but we, we can't do it here. We don't have time to really go into this. I mean, it seems to me that this topic, if you really went into it that way, uh, in trying to develop a novel line of, of thinking about it would take uh, weeks, not just minutes. So I'm not gonna do that. Uh, my only option then is to sort of speak telegraphically about these things and hope that some of you at least uh, understand what I'm getting at. Um, so let me just speak very briefly about nationalism. What's nationalism? 
Well, Hans Cohen, uh, one of the great scholars of days gone by on the subject, uh, sort of quipped once that nas na uh, nationalism is uh, applied to any group of people who can claim that they're a nation, they, they have enough in common to call themselves a nation and get away with it, all right? And he was only half joking. Uh, in the academic literature, uh, there's been a debate for years about uh, whether uh, nationalism is organic, whether it developed out of earlier uh, forms of social organization, uh, tribes and clans and so forth, uh, language groupings, um, or whether it is constructivist, whether there's something made up uh, in, in more modern times. And to me, it reminds me of an old, you know, of an old famous beer commercial in the United States for Miller Lite beer, you know, tastes great, less filling, tastes great. But these, these dichotomous ways of asking questions are usually not very useful. Uh, if you stand back and look at, uh, uh, at nationalism in different parts of the world, different eras, it's clearly both partly organic and partly constructed. One key thing that I think uh, uh, people need to understand is that uh, you can't get from, from, from tribal or clan uh, forms of politics in, in pre-modern times uh, to modern concepts of nationalism which are essentially metaphorical and abstract without literacy. What, what enables the turning of all, you know, pre-modern forms of social organization where you know, there's a, there was a limit uh, you know, to the size of, of political units and, and administration uh, is, is the abstract idea of nationalism. Now, you can feel yourself kindred with someone who speaks the same language, has the same cultural mazeways, uh, has the same conception of history, maybe has the same religious culture, you can feel kindred with people like that who you will never meet face to face in your life because nations are obviously much vaster uh, social conglomerations and organizations than, than tribes and, and uh, you know, sort of the precursors of those, those forms of social organization. But you need, you need literacy. You need, you need forms of ab abstract association for, for people to get their arms around the, the idea of a nation as opposed to you know, a concrete social organization like a tribe or a clan. Um, ultimately, then, there are, you know, we, just, just another brief comment on, on nationalism. Some people hate nationalism and think it's necessarily a liberal. Others point out that that's not the case and that, in fact, if, if it weren't for nationalism, if it weren't for liberal forms of nationalism, there would never be, on a mass scale, the ability to, uh, to have a democratic accountability in modern, in modern na na national states. There's never been democratic accountability in anything other than uh, a national state. Uh, neither neither uh, in the levels below it or no, not yet on the levels above it. Um, uh, nations, uh, depending on the kinds of uh, uh, attitudes toward uh, social life and economic life they, they adopt, has opened the way to economic uh, development, has, has, has gotten the West and other countries afterwards out of the Malthusian trap. So nationalism, you can debate it um, from an ideological point of view, we'll get to ideology in a second, but nationalism is uh, a complicated subject. It doesn't take the same form in different in every place. It doesn't take the same form in the same place at different times. It's a very, very capacious subject in and of itself. Um, ideology is a much newer word, actually. It's really kind of fascinating to go through uh, the evolution of the word. We don't have time to do that, but it, it only dates from the end of the 1700s. Um, and it, at first, uh, the first people who, who made it up at first really used the term as a, a synonym for intellectual history, but that meaning didn't stick. Um, uh, the French actually then took the term ideology and meant by it in French revolutionary times and in, during the, the period of the Napoleonic Wars, a, a program of radical reform, an explicit program of radical reform, the remaking of society after some ideal, ideal or idealist image of it. And uh, uh, again, to make a very, very long story short, um, uh, the term enters in German into German idealism, into Hegel, and into German Romanticism uh, in the period after the Napoleonic Wars, and it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes uh, again, uh, uh, ideal, ideal conceptions of how uh, societies can be reordered to produce um, uh, better outcomes. But it then it, it, it leaned on in the, in the German Romantic, um, uh, uh, in the hands of German Romantics, it became highly utopian in character. And there's a very famous book by Karl Mannheim called Ideology and Utopia that describes this, this process. When the Marxists got their hands on the phrase ideology, what they meant by it was bourgeois ideology. They meant by it when um, Antonio Gramsci comes along by the 1920s, they mean false consciousness. They mean uh, the, uh, the leaders of capitalist societies peddling a line 
that would alienate people from their own best interests. In other words, you know, smoke and mirrors. But then along comes, pretty soon along comes Eric Vogel and other people, and they turn that back around on the Marxists. The Marxists, they claim that they, uh, that, that Marxism wasn't an ideology. Marxism was the, the master science, of course. It was science. Uh, Vogel said, no, it isn't. It's just, a, it's an ideology, and it bears a lot in common with theology. It's a secularized form of theology, which means it's unfalsifiable. And people who propagate it, uh, propagate utopian schemes, uh, never admit that they ever make a mistake. And ultimately, uh, if you arm a utopian ideology, it will eventually eat its own children. Anyway, so so said so said uh, Eric Vogelin, uh, and he had, you know he's kind of a cult figure nowadays on the right center right. Uh, so I'm just trying to show you that the term ideology has has morphed over the years to mean different and even opposite things. Um, most forms of ideology, uh, explicit ideology, I ideal templates for social reform. They all involve three, at least three things. Some of them involve more. It's important to understand what, what an ideology claims, claims to do. The first thing that it does is it redefines the relationships between individuals, the individual, the society, and the state, uh, based on some stipulated concept of human nature, usually. Uh, whether human nature is inherently conflictual, whether it's cooperative, whether it's some of both. Uh, but there's, at the bottom of all ideologies, especially idealist utopian ideologies, there is some stipulated concept of human nature. The second thing it does is it almost always, just about always, specifically outlines some specific role of the state in the economy. Because in the 20th century, anyway, when this sort of gets rolling, it's the economy that's considered to be the engine of how, of how social relations uh, are formed. It's not, exact, it's not accurate, but that's what people believed uh, at the time. And then lastly, the third thing it does, third thing an ideology does, is it, de it defines the role of the nation in terms of the rest of the world. So that's where the international aspects of, of ideology come into play. Now, this isn't the only way to think about ideology. Uh, sociologists and anthropologists in more recent times, re really starting in the 1950s, and 1960s, 70s, in reaction against, uh, you know, Skinnerian ways of thinking about um, of society, uh, took a more phenomenological view. And I'm sorry if this, this vocabulary is a little bit um, stressful and challenging to some of you, but there won't, it won't last much longer, I promise. Uh, again, back to Clifford Geertz. Geertz wrote a very well-known uh, influential essay in the 1960s called Ideology as a Cultural System. What did he mean by that? He simply pointed out that, you know, all societies have myths, not myths in the sense of, an, of, an, of a typically, uh, you know, an obviously false uh, narrative, but myths in the sense of a mythopoetical framework whereby people understand the forces that are loose around them that can't be contained by physical, material, empirical analysis. I mean, politics is about, you know, a series of moral choices that don't have, you know, uh, necessary empirical reference. They're, 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 they're things that human beings create in and of themselves as, as time and, and, and life moves on. Uh, my mentor, Irving Goffman, used to put it this way, social life takes up and freezes into itself the conceptions we have of it. So it is an autogenic, self-fulfilling kind of thing that, that that's what social life really is. So, I mean, Geertz wrote back in the 60s that basically every society has a series of, you know, stories that they tell, narratives that they tell. Uh, it's about origins. It's about uh, stories of credit and blame. Uh, they're little nuggets that you socialize children with. People, you know, grow up with a common set of, you know, more or less common set of principles and values. As long as these work in society, as long as they become an organic part of social life, they're very rarely consciously articulated. They're simply part, they, they, they flow seamlessly into social life. It's only when they become problematical, when they no longer explain uh, what's in front of everybody's nose, that they become problematized and objectified. And that's what Geert says is an ideology is. An ideology, uh, uh, the, an explicit ideology arises in a given society when the assumptions that have heretofore guided it and kept it, kept it you know, on an even keel uh, become problematic and don't work anymore. So in other words, if, if you take that, that idea of what, of what an ideology is as a, as a cultural system, it really does arise out of culture, right? It's not just uh, an explicit like manifesto that somebody sits down and thinks up one day in a library in London or something. It's a much more organic process that, uh, that comes out of social uh, 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 disruption or dysfunction or challenge. Um, uh, that's all I want to say about, about uh, these terms, about, about nationalism and, and ideology. Uh, uh, there's much more that could be said, but again, the, the point I want to leave you with is 
if you take the Geertsian view of ideology as a cultural system, in other words, if you embed it in a broad sociology, a phenomenological sociology, you're actually thinking about the subject in a much more uh, mature social science kind of way. However, the problem is if you do that, since so, this is not that many people out in the world, and certainly the political classes in the United States and other countries are not aware of phenomenological sociology, if they've never heard of Clifford Geertz, and if you, if you talk to them about ideology as a cultural system, instead of a sort of common conventional way that people think about it, right, uh, uh, they won't know what you're talking about. They'll think you, you know, you fell out of a tree and hit your head. So it turns out that the most sophisticated intellectual way to, to, to get to get arms around these two very abstract concepts, both nationalism and especially ideology, are not ways that are going to allow you to flow into a normal political discourse, whether in the United States or anywhere else. So it's kind of a paradox. Um, uh, let's now just sort of ease our way into the, the Sino-American business, if we can. Uh, I think I mentioned before in, in some of these, some of these uh, discussions that when I when I uh, when I'm in a quandary over China, I uh, I either go into when I'm in Singapore, I go and talk to uh, Gung Wu, Wang Gung Wu, uh, or I write him a note, and uh, he's usually very generous with his time. But one of the things that uh, that Gung Wu wrote for uh, the American Interest back in the day, he wrote a people on he wrote an essay on the fact that uh, neither the United States nor China has ever been a typical nation state. And by nation state, normative term meaning that the state overlaps with the, with the you know, with the, the, the light culture, you know, the main ethnicity that the state is, is ruling. So the United States has always been uh, uh, more of an idea, civic nationalism, not a bloodline nationalism. It's been an experiment. Uh, it's taken many forms. There have been at least three or four uh, discrete American republics, uh, you know, since, since 1776. China has never been a normal nation state either. It's been an empire of various, of various kinds. Uh, uh, over many, many thousands of years, took very different forms. But neither, neither country has ever been a sort of a typical nation state in a world made up of nation states, you know, according to the, you know, the sort of the classic modern European definition of what it means. Uh, and uh, Gung Wu argued in this article that both countries are struggling to find a way to uh, reconstruct or redefine them, not necessarily consciously, but just in terms of you know, in their relationship with the world, how do they comport themselves with other countries that are, um, that are embedded in, at least, uh, at least they think they are anyway, in, what, in a territorial nation state system? Um, and I think that's an interesting question, you know, about uh, the sort of the background to the relationship that neither, neither the United States nor China has ever been quite normal and stable in terms of its, of its basic, you know, political, political uh, identity it, and it keeps changing and now we're at a time when these are the two you know two very large powers are coming into contact with each other all over the world especially in Asia and they're coming in contact with each other is still trying to come to terms with themselves about what they are in terms of their identity in a in a changing world um, so it just seems to me that what's happening now in the United States I'm not going to talk much about China because I, I said I'm not really much of an expert on China, I don't claim to be. What's happening in the United States is that we seem to need uh, a, what the Chinese call a rectification of names. Uh, language is getting used in the United States the, lately in very weird, lazy, strange, strange ways. It's a little bit uh, discomforting. I wanna talk just for a minute about uh, the, 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 the term new Cold War. Uh, almost everybody now in the United States, I'm not sure about outside the United States, when they wanna refer, you know, in a shorthand to the, the Sino-American rivalry, to the change in the relationship over the past couple of years, uh, it's almost automatic that they use the phrase a new Cold War. And this is wrong. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you want to use the Cold War as a metaphor, or as an analog, talk about the Sino-American rivalry, and rivalry is a perfectly good term. I don't know why people feel like they need to, they need to, to use this term new Cold War. I mean, if you, if you dumb down uh, the meaning of the term Cold War, as the model of, of you know, how the, the US-Soviet rivalry worked after roughly 1947 through 1991, if you dumb it down sufficiently so that it just means a great power uh, conflict that doesn't actually uh, lead to shooting, that there's no hot war, then practically any, any great power relationship will fall under that definition. If you were gonna use the term Cold War in a careful way, and if you just sat down to think about what the, what the US-Soviet Cold War actually was, you would see that the term new Cold War doesn't really fit uh, at all. There are four, and we'll get to the, back to the ideology, there are four characteristics, it seems to me, that define the Cold War, 
between the United States and the Soviet Union. The first was that the Soviet Union and, and the United States in military and political terms were basically peer competitors. I don't think that China is yet a peer competitor with the United States on a global scale. Uh, it may become one fairly soon, especially if American politics and stability decline rapidly, which you, know, you could argue is happening. But I think right now, uh, China is not yet a peer competitor with the United States. The second one is more important though, and that's the ideological piece. The Cold War wasn't just about ideology, it was also about geopolitics, but it was largely about ideology. P both sides thought that the, the moral, political moral paternity of the entire world was at stake in who won the Cold War. Uh, if the West won the Cold War, then there would be liberty and there would be market, market economies and so on. So, but if, if the Soviet Union and its allies won the Cold War, then there would be authoritarian government and there would be command economies and there would be gulags and, and so forth. Both sides actually believed that there was a moral element in this. I mean, I find it very hard to believe that, uh, that uh, uh, in China, there's some design for world domination, that there's a, a sense in Beijing that the Communist Party uh, is seriously concerned about the political paternity of every country, all 193 countries in the United Nations, that it means something to them, for example, that 20 years from now, Zambia well, or some other, you know, or Honduras should look more like China in terms of its political organization than the, you know, I don't think they care one way or the other about that. I, when, when, when Secretary Pompeo talks about China having a plan for world, world domination, I don't know if I want to grab a wet mop or call a psychiatrist because I just don't see any evidence you know, for that kind of ideological, uh, ideological reach. The third thing about the Cold War was that it was fought, it was, the competition was among blocks, not just two countries. Uh, and the fact that there were blocks involved gave a fluidity to what actually became a world system for, you know, the, the better part of 40 years. Coalition maintenance was, became very important in, on, to both sides. You could peel away or, uh, or countries would fall away from one block or another. There was competition over third parties that were not technically aligned with, but maybe lean to one, one side or the other. It, the US-China relationship doesn't resemble block contest at all. Where are the blocks? What's China's block? Cambodia? Uh, some block. Uh, the American block, the American alliance structure has changed dramatically since the end of the Cold War. Uh, it's, it's much more loose in Europe than it ever was, and the nature of European politics is different now than it was before 1991 with uh, the expansion of the European Union, the, the, uh, the invention of the Euro. Uh, the, the American alliance system in Asia uh, was never as coherent or tight as, uh, as it was in, in, uh, in Europe, and in order to make it that way, uh, in, order to in order to make the Cold War uh, uh, analogy with China make any sense, China would have to have a block and the United States would have to tighten its alliance structures in, 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 uh, in Asia to approximate what, what, it look, what they looked like in Europe back before 1991. That's not going to happen. And then, and then the fourth element that doesn't make any sense is that the Soviet Union and the United States and during the Cold War had, were, were, had very, very little economic relationship with one another. Soviets deliberately wanted to be autarkic, right? Uh, that's not the case. Um, in, with the U.S.-China relationship, obviously, and even, uh, you know, people talk about um, decoupling, they talk about hard decoupling, e even, even uh, uh, when, when COVID is, is gone and, and people, you know, the dust, the dust settles, there's not going to be an autarkic, uh, you know, mutually exclusive economic uh, set, set of economic zones between the United States and China. That's, that's unthinkable. Um, so the, the, the analogy just, just doesn't match. It doesn't, it doesn't fit, but people do it anyway and you can't stop them anymore. But the same thing is true of the loose use of ideology. I wanna just, I wanna just give you two quotes uh, from uh, the American literature lately, uh, just to give you some sense of, of, of just how off the rails some people are thinking about, about these subjects. Um, uh, here's, I'm not gonna give the name of the author. Uh, if you really wanna know, you can ask me later, but here's a quote from uh, 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 an essay that, that appeared in the American Interest. It wouldn't have appeared in the American Interest if I was still the editor, but it appeared, and this is what, this is, this is how it reads. Uh, this is called, the, from an article called The Shape of a Real Grand Strategy, U.S. Grand Strategy. Quote, ideological difference lie at the core of the competition with China. The United States and its allies have built both national and international systems meant to secure and promote individual liberty and flourishing a social contract meant to manage to uh, manifest each person's natural rights. Beijing has built and continues to build an imperial polity with both a countervailing political ideology and a nationalist purpose. It seeks to create a global order, global order, and to secure and promote the Chinese Communist Party, which enjoys the mandate or unity of heaven in order to manifest the natural greatness of the Han people as a whole. 
These basic views of the just society are ant ant antipathetic, even incompatible. They both resent, represent universal moral and ontological claims, and, and so on and so on. So this is the idea that actually the, the, the rivalry between the United States and, and China is ideological. I'll give you an even more, uh, an even more extreme uh, uh, argument, the same case, all right? This is from a, another article called The Building Blocks of a China Strategy, all right? Decoupling, quote, decoupling is the f but the first necessary step on the road to what is and will remain an enduring competition between the United States and the People's Republic of China for years to come. This competition is not only over markets or technology, rather it requires confronting China's thoroughgoing revisionism that seeks to reorder both the global di distribution of power and the normative structures in place since 1945. To prevail, we, meaning the United States and the West, we must recognize that we are not facing China as a civilization, but rather a communist power whose ideology has always been at its core totalitarian. What is unfolding before our eyes and has been underway for three decades since the end of the Cold War is the second and possibly decisive and final stage of conflict between liberal democracy and communism." Close quote. I think both of these, both of these uh, arguments are very close to insane. I think they're quite mad. As I said, I don't think there is a serious ideological clash between the United States and China. I don't think that China has a plan for world domination, contrary to what Secretary Pompeo says. Uh, to me, he sounds like John Foster Dulles at his worst in the middle of the 1950s. And I want to call your attention in this regard. I'll come back to this in a second if I can. I want to call your attention to Ann Applebaum's uh, excellent essay in the Atlantic in the July-August issue called uh, History Will Judge the Complicit. Because in that essay, she argues that Pompeo and also um, Attorney General Barr think they're living in Christian end of days times. Uh, uh, this is an important, I mean, assuming this is correct, and it might be, this is an important point I'll come to uh, in conclusion. But when I look, when I look uh, uh, for a model, a historical model of what the Chinese are doing right now, I don't see, I don't see China as a Marxist or, or a communist state. I see it as a Leninist state. Uh, and an aspiring uh, to be, a, you know, a, a, a more controlling surveillance Leninist state, but I don't think anybody in China takes communist or Marxist ideology seriously anymore. Um, to me, it, if I had to actually, you know, point uh, to a, an historical analogy that describes it, I, I would call it something that a lot of us thought, you know, had disappeared 200 years ago. It's mercantilist. This is economic nationalism. What the Chinese seem to me to be, to be wanting to do isn't very different from what the Spanish and the Portuguese and then the Dutch and the French and the British uh, tried to do at the start of, start of the modern era, starting in the 1500s. In some respects, I think that China, in a way, is just picking up from the, from the point where its historical decline became acute in the middle of the 19th century. So it seems to me that, you know, with the Chinese, this is, this is, this is a, a kind of a geoeconomic strategy. China wants to become rich. Uh, it thinks by becoming rich that it can become secure and strong. It, there's obviously a geopolitical element to it, but it seems to me that the geopolitical element of Chinese strategy follows from the geoeconomic aim, okay, which is to uh, protect China from poverty, to bring people out of poverty, to restore the dignity of the state, to uh, create eternal stability, and to defend the country from presumably its its uh, its detractors and its and its potential enemies. Um, you know, again, I don't think that, that the Chinese Communist Party has this vision of the future moral political paternity of the rest of the world and that they're going to fight to the death, you know, be willing to, to wage nuclear war in order to bring that about. I just, this just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, I don't want to talk about the geopolitical elements of the Chinese strategy, I would, but I really think it's mostly about money. Now, you know, that's the way it is right now. It doesn't have to stay that way. Uh, strategies have a have a tendency sometimes to crawl or creep forward. Sometimes interests um, expand with power and ambition ex expands with power. But right now, you know, the wolf warrior sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the pop in the popular culture and, and the, uh, the sort of the, the new arrogance and the aspects of Chinese diplomacy, I don't think that, that, uh, that, that defines the Chinese state or, or defines the, the strategy of the, the Communist Party. Frank Lavin, uh, who is in Singapore right now and who uh, was the ambassador, the American ambassador, um, has an article um, not that long ago about, you know, why is it that China and the United States, especially China, has so much trouble making friends? Uh, China's aggressive uh, uh, behavior in, re in, recent, uh, in recent months and, I guess, years now under Xi Jinping, Ambassador Lavin suggests that this is an outgrowth of the unitary state, uh, control of the state that the Chinese Communist Party has 
has created, and it doesn't necessarily signal some sort of you know, global aggressive intent. And I think, I think Ambassador Levin is correct about that. Uh, I would even speculate further if I had more time, but I don't. Let me just say that from the, from the last thing I'll say, from the American point of view, uh, we have this tendency in the United States when we're aroused or when we're confused or when we have internal difficulties as we are, we are having uh, in, recent, uh, in recent months and years, we have this, we have this, this tendency to um, theologize geopolitics. Uh, there, are, there are times when American foreign policy is simply um, a secularized version of Protestant eschatology. Uh, this is, I think this is certainly the case right now and how a lot, not all Americans obviously, but how a lot of Americans see China. Uh, we thought, a lot of people thought in the United States that China was going to be a stakeholder in Robert Zellick's language. Um, and that uh, th there's this kind of theology, it kind of, it's kind of a secular theology in American thinking, American social science, that once uh, there's a middle class and once people reach a certain per capita income, that suddenly uh, authoritarian politics will implode, there'll be a middle class, that middle class will advocate for its interest, politics will pluralize, and ultimately, who knows, they might even become procedurally democratic in ways that people in the West and elsewhere recognize. And uh, the, most people in the United States thought that, you know, the economic relationship with China, bringing China into uh, the World Trade Organization, other international institutions, that ultimately, over time, this would, would be the trajectory of the Chinese political system. Well, it turned out that that wasn't the case, and people took umbrage. And now, what, now, now we talk about hard decoupling, which is just a word that, you know, back in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they used to call shunning. There's a lot of, relig of, of masked religious language. It's, it's unself-aware, of course, in the United States. But this is like a passion play. When, when Americans get angry or worried about some foreign power that they don't really understand, they almost invariably speak in, in cloaked religious metaphors without even realize that, re realizing that they're doing it. Um, so that is what I think is going on right now. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if I had more time, I would give you more examples of what I mean. But you know, if, the, if people in the United States consider uh, in this, in this uh, you know, secularized religious narrative that uh, that Americans are uh, the children of the sons of light, right? And somebody has to be the children of the sons of darkness. And if we can't find one, then we're very likely to go out and invent one. And I think that's what some people anyway are doing right now with respect to China. And I think it's kind of dangerous. Uh, uh, the misuse of language, uh, you know, applying the word ideology to things that in my view are really cultural. Uh, I don't want to downplay the cultural differences. They're profound. In fact, I can't think of uh, two peoples on this earth that are more likely to misunderstand one another and not even realize that it's happening than Americans and Chinese. And that's for reasons of culture and history and language, but it doesn't mean that they are, they are doomed to fight a war with one another, that they're doomed to be enemies. What, what the world needs right now, I mean, immediately uh, in recovering from COVID and trying to rebuild globalization in a way that is more stable, less, uh, less, less, less shock prone and more equitable, both among countries and within countries, are leaderships that understand the possibility of positive sum relationships, okay? Uh, the world can't do this without the United States and the United States can't do this alone. But what we see right now is we see in both countries, in, different, in slightly different ways, we see uh, 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 zero sum kinds of thinking. We certainly see that in the Trump administration. I think if we have a new administration in January, I hope, um, that will subside to some extent on the, on the US side. But the ideologies involved, the, the, the self-conceptions, are moving away from uh, the, uh, the necessity to, 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 to find common solutions to global problems. And instead, people are moving into polarized and antagonistic po points of view. I don't see that how that helps anybody. Um, uh, I, I, so again, you know, this, this idea that you know, the Chinese and Americans are involved in a new Cold War. You know, a new Cold War, if it, let's assume that's true, if you dumb down the idea, let's assume that's true. That's a Cold War. That means that there's no war, there's no shooting, there's no fighting, there's no blood, right? Uh, I would almost be happy if there were a new Cold War, because what I'm worried about is a hot war. Um, uh, I, I just don't like the trajectory of, of, the, of the way the relationship is going. It's in free fall. Um, as far as I know, there's, there are no private channels that, that, uh, that backstop against uh, an accident getting out of hand. I'm not worried about a new Cold War. I'm worried about a hot war. And I think both sides are displaying uh, lava flows of irrationality. Both sides are scapegoating the other politically for domestic political purposes, though they're different purposes. And so that's, that's how I see you know, the, the relationship uh, developing right now. And it, I find it kind of frightening. Um, I'll stop there. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over. Um, we'll see what the Q&A brings. Uh, 
you can ask me questions about China, but like I say, don't expect a good answer because I'm not a, not a China expert. Okay, over to you, Adrian, and let's see if let's see what we have by way of questions. Thank you, Adam, for your for your talk. Um, we have one question here. Um, the question is, to what extent do you think Amer America's exceptionalism based on its sense of superior ideals has shaped and colored its policies towards China? Well, that's a great question, because I would say, if you look back in history, if you look at American China policy, you know, going back to really when it starts, which is, you know, from the beginning, that really gets sort of, sort of congeals in the period just before the first opium war, absolutely American exceptionalism uh, shaped our attitude toward China historically. Um, you know, in the 1830s, before the, before the first opium war, there was a huge debate in the United States. It's long since lost in the mists of history books now, but the debate, uh, uh, it, it comes back uh, in different forms. One group uh, argued that um, America stood for self-determination, right? That was, that, that's the hallmark of, uh, of uh, the United States and breaking away from the British Empire, self-determination. So with regard to China, what the United States wanted was a China that was integral and that was not usurped by European imperialists. But on the other hand, there were people who argued, no, uh, it was more important that modern progressive ideas, which meant in those days also Protestant Christianity, uh, be, uh, be uh, uh, introduced into China. And so there were lots of, there were lots of Americans who argued that uh, the United States should, should, should support British policy. And there was a lot of missionary interest in the United States in those days. And so there was an argument, a pretty serious argument going all the way back to that period and you see later on in the 1880s and 1890s when the open door under John Hay, uh, when the open door policy arises, you get the same, the same kind of tension and conflict. Uh, uh, the United States, the open door meant lots of things, meant three different things. It might have meant, uh, it's at times meant, as, as the years went on, at times it meant uh, to save uh, uh, Chinese territorial integrity from European and later Japanese uh, depredations. Uh, it could also mean, you know, uh, putting down a stake for an American sh a share in the China trade. A and it could mean uh, 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 the United States trying to use China as a, a power balancing uh, element in order to fend off uh, what looked like increasingly aggressive Japanese imperial ambitions. And at various times, it was all, it was all three of those things. So American policy, um, but, but in, in that policy, there was always an idealistic element. There were always people in the State Department and in the government who took an idealistic, exceptionalist view of China. And in American policy over the years, there have been those who've, who've tended to see the Chinese as the good guys in the, Asian, in the Asian constellation, while there are others who at various times tended to see the Japanese as the modernizers and the good guys and more like Americans. And this, this theme you know, of like the pro-China or pro-Japanese ways of thinking about the extension of American values uh, American exceptionalist values to Asia, this has been a constant tension in American policy for, you know, well over a hundred years. But what I sense now is discontinuity, is discontinuity, at least to some extent. Uh, the Obama administration and then the Trump administration uh, were really the first, these were the first presidents in American history to disavow exceptionalism the way that all their predecessors had affirmed it. There was a famous incident where when the first uh, international trip that President Obama took was to London, and somebody in the somebody in the news in the correspondence court asked him about American exceptionalism, and his answer was very interesting. He said, "Well, of course, American Americans think that they're exceptional, but so do the British, and so does every other country think that they're exceptional." So it was a way of poo pieing the idea. Uh, in the case of Donald Trump, it's more than poo pieing it. I mean, it's it, it's downright downright Randian cynicism. Donald Trump doesn't believe in American exceptionalism. He believes in uh, in zero sum uh, transactional, you know, instrumentalized relationships. So we've had a a, a period of time when uh, very little talk, uh, very little exceptional exceptionalist language has come out of the out of the Oval Office. And there's an argument in the United States: Is this the new normal? I mean, do they have the you know have the have has myth has deferred myth maintenance in the United States gotten to a point where there is no way to go back to uh, the idealism of earlier times uh, or not. Uh, 
Some people argue that there'll be another shock at some point and the God talk will start again and the exceptional stuff will begin again. And that could be, because I think, we're, as, I, as I indicated in my talk, we're seeing some of that now. People who want to stigmatize China are using ideological language and they're using exceptionalist, they're using strands of exceptionalist language to do that. And in the, in the two excerpts that I read, you could hear evidence of that. Where the country as a whole is, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, if, if Joe Biden becomes president, I sincerely doubt uh, that um, uh, there will be a full-throated form of exceptionalism. On the other hand, it won't be as, uh, as cynical and as uh, uh, denigrative of American ideals and principles as they have been during the three and a half years so far and so on the, of the Trump administration. So it's a great question. Um, I, and I don't, I mean, one more, just one more point. Except when there is a, an acute crisis uh, in U.S.-China relationship, U.S. The U.S. China relationship, um, or when there is a decision point that comes, uh, you know, to the top, to the to the president, to the head of the government, like for example, the decision to um, to uh, accord permanent most favored nation status in 1999, WTO membership in the year 2000, uh, Tiananmen Square before that brought things to a head. Uh, maybe Hong Kong uh, more recently has has, but I can't say it's brought anything to a head because this administration isn't normal in terms of process. Usually, there is no unified China policy in the United States. There just isn't. Uh, the Defense Department has, a, has an attitude and a policy toward China. And within the Defense Department, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force have three, and the Marines have three different, four different policies toward China. The Treasury Department, the Trade Representative's Office, the State Department, and, di different, and, and different uh, parts of the State Department, the Human Rights part of the State Department, right? Uh, 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 they all have different attitudes. They all have different pieces of, you know, the great big Chinese elephant. There is no unified policy except on those mo at, at those moments when things come to a head and the president has to make some, some critical decisions. It tends to just drift. Uh, that changed a little bit in the Trump administration with the emphasis over the trade, the trade stuff, over the tariffs and the trade stuff. That kind of congealed it. And Chinese behavior before that and since, you know, with Ladakh and India, with Hong Kong, uh, with the South China Sea militarization, with what's going on in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs, this has brought more focus to China uh, than has been typically the case since the opening in 1972. But is it? it, it but is how much is how much is this new congealing of focus on China? How much of that is affected by ex the exceptionalist way of thinking? It's a great question. I don't know the answer. I think it's there's some of it still there. It tends to be there on the extremes you know, on, on the left that cares about human rights and, and democracy promotion, on the right that tends to care about, you know, sort of what I would call an atavistic, uh, atavistic nationalism. But in the policy center, I think it's waned. I think it's weaker than it has been uh, in, in the long history, the traditional history of, of, uh, of American attitudes toward China and toward Asia. But it's a great question. And uh, maybe if I get, get a chance to think more about it, I can, I can produce a better answer. It's a good question. Thank you, Adam. Uh, we have another question that deals with uh, nationalism and, and ideology. So the question is, is the nature of nationalism different in multi-ethnic immigrant countries than it is in countries that are single ethnic countries? So I- Absolutely. I mean, well, first of all, there aren't very many countries that are single ethnic countries. I mean, Japan comes pretty close. Uh, but if you, look at, if you look around the map of the 190 some countries, I mean, look, the, the term nation state is a normative term. It was invented in the late 19th century uh, as uh, a, a term to, to, to be wielded against the imperial principle, right? It, that was the revolutionary idea of, you know, you know the, the mid and late industrial revolution, that, that uh, uh, the old way where, you know, for example, Germans in Europe and in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Holy Roman Empire, Habsburg monarchy, uh, German-speaking people would rule Czechs and Romanians and Slovenes and Poles and so on. The idea of a nation state was that the state should be coterminous with the, with the majority ethnic group, right? But if you look at how the world has evolved, you look at all the countries in Africa and Asia, not very many of them are homogeneous, all right? Um, but yes, there's a huge difference between immigrant, uh, immigrant countries like the United States or even Australia, but the United States is, is, is in a category of its, of its own because of the enormous diversity of American society. Uh, this is the difference between civic and bloodline nationalisms. Now, there are no pure types of either one. 
I mean, even in America's, uh, you know, more rarefied and abstract civic nationalism, which is about the American creed and, you know, conceptions of life in the public sphere, there were hearth cultures. Uh, David Hackett Fisher's book, Albion Seed, is a beautiful description of how those hearth cultures came from England to the United States and recreated the differences that they, 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 they uh, that existed in, in the British Isles in the United States. And then later the Germans came, uh, and other people came. Um, so th there, there are bloodline, there are bloodline aspects to, you know, to, to the United States. I mean, Lincoln, after all, called upon the sacred chords of memory, you know, in the, in, in, in the second inaugural. So there, there's a bloodline piece there, and it's, it's, and it's bound up, as it almost always is, with, with religious culture, and again, with this mythopoetical, with these, these stories of origins and credit and blame. Um, but, but civic nationalisms are different uh, from, blood, from, from predominantly bloodline, like German nationalism, bloodline, Korean nationalism, bloodline nationalism, right? They are different because they require much more maintenance. Because they're more abstract, they're more fragile. They're more they're they're more prone to disruption. The socialization process, the teaching of civics, is more important in countries where the the, the glue that holds the society together is more abstract and ideational, and requires literacy, and requires practice, and requires passing along. They're, they're gossamer threads that, if they're broken, are very hard to repair. I, I'm afraid that we're at a, we're at a time like that right, right now. Uh, and we, and I really, what, what, um, what, what part of the Trump constituency, the core constituency, is trying to do right now, the president too, uh, uh, so far as he understands any of this, they're trying to substitute a dirty white form of bloodline nationalism for the civic nationalism that has always been the mainstream of the American national idea. Now, these kinds of people have been around for a long time. Conspiracy theories have been around for a long time. In the 1820s, we had a party called the Anti-Masonic Party. It was a full-fledged conspiracy, conspiracy theory party. It didn't, didn't do very well, but it existed, right? But, uh, so there, and they've always, there's always been this kind of, you know, uh, atavistic, xenophobic, uh, you know, bloodline, uh, bloodline descant in American national thinking. Uh, Richard Hofstadter referred to it as the, par comes out of the paranoid style uh, in American politics, right? But, and everybody, that's a classic book, but, but uh, civic nationalism has typically been uh, the dominant strain. What, what, because of demographic fears, you know, all the, just the, the, all the reports that, you know, so-called white people in the United States are going to become, you know, uh, 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 prey to a, a, a majority of minorities. At a certain point, the demographic lines are supposed to cross in the year 20, 2040, probably not even true, but uh, and it doesn't matter if it is true because uh, America, say America was never a bloodline nationalism as such, but there's been a paranoia that's been, that's been created uh, as a result of this. And you see now this dirty white form of ethnic nationalism vying with you know, the, what has been the mainstream for more than 200 years. Um, and that's, what, that's part of the dynamic now that you can see playing out in the polarization of American politics. So absolutely, there's, a, there's, a, there, there no, I, there, there's no, there's no extant example of ideal types either of bloodline, hardly any, of bloodline or of, of, of civic nationalism, but, but they are distinguishable. And it doesn't matter what is dominant uh, in a given political culture at any given time. So I hope that helps to answer some anyway of the, of, good question again, good question. Is there a third question or a fourth yeah. question? Yeah, Adam, uh, we have another question that asks about Secretary Pompeo's recent remarks to, to ASEAN foreign ministers about, you know, not letting uh, sort of China bully countries in, in, in the region and, and to reconsider uh, doing business with, with China. Do you see that as the U.S. taking a more explicit stance trying to bring Southeast Asia into a, a U.S. block against China? Well, it looks like that, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, you could certainly interpret his remarks that way, and I'm, I think they're most regrettable. Uh, if you talk to uh, pe government people in Singapore, and if you talk to government people in other Southeast Asian countries, I haven't, thanks to COVID, I didn't get to visit as many as I, I wanted to, but even Vietnam is a good example. Uh, what Southeast Asian countries uh, are good at, what they like to do, what they think they need to do is a hedge, right? Uh, they don't want to be forced to choose. Because if, you've, if, some, if the United States forces um, Southeast Asian countries to choose, or forces ASEAN as a whole, if such a thing really even can be said to exist, to choose, they're going to they're tick off somebody else, all right? Uh, basically, what uh, small countries, uh, especially very small countries, like Singapore, want is maximum flexibility to, uh, to maneuver uh, with the tides and with the winds. 
And I think it makes uh, Singaporeans and it makes others in Southeast Asia very uncomfortable when the American Secretary of State speaks stridently like that and would force choices on, on, uh, on leaderships that don't wish to make such choices. Uh, the Prime Minister had a piece in Foreign Affairs a couple of months ago, uh, making essentially, well, not, not just that point, but making that point and, and a few others. So I think this is counterproductive. Um, I mean, the idea, for example, look, well, Singapore is a, a good example. Singapore um, has achieved um, what it has achieved over the past several decades, thanks, of course, to its own, its own exertions and its own investment in itself and its own efforts. But the environment has been set by uh, an American grand strategy that provided um, global security goods, that provided security goods to the global commons and allowed an open and free trading relationship that has enabled Singapore to be, you know, uh, the uh, uh, the international transshipment um, port and the international uh, uh, juggernaut investment and and uh, and otherwise technology that it is. Um, if that so you know if that goes away, uh, if uh, a, a cho if if U.S. Chinese relations are embittered to the point where uh, uh, that kind of that kind of security and stability goes away, uh, then uh, then everybody's poor, everybody's worse off. It seems to me. So to, to, for, for Secretary Pompeo to force the issue, uh, to basically, to, uh, to embitter um, uh, gratuitously uh, the U.S.-Chinese relationship at the expense of the equities of Southeast Asian countries seems to me to be um, unwise. Um, I wasn't fond of the speech, in other words. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Adam. Um, we have another question from, from a viewer about Taiwan, about your view of, of, of the Taiwan issue and whether you think, right, sort of the central issue in, in Sino-U.S. relations is now going to be about Taiwan. Yeah, I, as I'm not an expert in, um, in Taiwan. I've never even been there. Uh, I wanted to go. COVID stopped me. Uh, uh, a lot of people think that Taiwan is going to become a serious problem. Uh, because the Chinese may be feeling their oats at having subdued Hong Kong. So what's next, you know, in the, uh, in the, uh, the historical quest to reassemble essentially all the pieces of um, what, used to be, used to, what used to be China. Um, and there, there are people who think that, um, you know, the status quo of the past several decades can't last. Uh, I don't see why uh, it can't last. Um, the status quo right now serves basically everyone's interest, seems to me. Um, uh, mistakes happen. Um, politicians and statesmen do dumb things uh, from time to time. History is full of folly. Uh, there, are, there are three things that could wreck the, what is a tolerable, ambiguous, and therefore tolerable status quo. One is if um, Taiwanese politics goes a little haywire and uh, there's an urge to declare independence. If, uh, if that actually happened, it would, uh, it would give the United States an opportunity to, to take itself off the hook as it were, for, um, uh, it's, uh, from its obligations to defend Taiwan from, from aggression. Uh, but that might happen anyway. A second uh, bizarre thing uh, would be if uh, at some point, whether because of economic um, panic or difficulties or, or a, a political crisis in China, uh, if the wolf warrior sort of mentality in China uh, led to uh, a blockade or firing missiles at Taiwan to intimidate Taiwan, something like that, hoping to um, evoke a political crisis in Taiwan, that could force, you know, the situation to unravel. Or if the United States um, uh, got involved in a shooting war with China, uh, let's say there were, a, you know, there was a freedom of navigation exercise near Palawan Island in the Philippines and there was an accident, somebody hit somebody, uh, and maybe the, there was a rumor that some rogue wolf warrior element in the PLA Navy uh, had, uh, had fired on an American vessel and killed American soldiers, uh, but that the United States didn't believe it was a rogue element and it blamed the Politburo. And so you can, imagine, you can imagine an accident like that very quickly getting out of hand under current circumstances with no hotline, no back channel, all right? If there were a general shooting war uh, uh, breakout, uh, the Chinese might think this is their chance to uh, essentially surround or intimidate or collapse the, the Taiwanese government. So um, you could see from, from you know, the three, po three points on this, tri there are more than three points, but you can see from the three points, Taiwan, United States, uh, China, 
you could see the thing unravel and and uh, very quickly devolve into a mess, a real mess. Uh, but I don't think I don't I don't I don't think it's going to happen because um, I, I again I think the status quo more or less more or less um, serves the the limited purposes of all the parties. I mean, in some years from now, it, things might change if uh, the Chinese military developed the capacity to actually not just not just blockade or intimidate, but actually to invade, seize, and control Taiwan. But the Chinese military can't do that now. And it's kind of hard for me to imagine a situation where they could do that in any foreseeable future. I mean, Taiwan is a going concern. It's a pretty big place. It has a large population. It doesn't want to be taken over and occupied uh, like that. I mean, it would resist and it would have help resisting. I just don't see, um, I just don't see, uh, uh, the military situation changing in such a way that you know clear lines of of uh, of, of domination would open up. Um, it's also true, by the way, that uh, uh, if I mean, if the United States wanted to, it could st like it did in 1996, it could still sail carrier battle groups into the Straits of Taiwan. It could still do that. Uh, the U.S. Navy, frail frail and problematic as it, it's become in recent in recent years, can still defend Taiwan if it wants to. But, what, but at what cost, right? But, but so in other words, the ambiguity and, and, the, uh, and the uncertainties that have always, that have always attended this, this relationship still remain as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, I do, I do worry about people kind of losing their, uh, their, their grip on sanity, either the Taiwanese or the Chinese or the Americans. But uh, I don't think it's inevitable and I don't think it's likely. And, um, you know, again, um, you got to be careful. Uh, uh, l let's suppose, for example, that Trump uh, wins re-election. Could happen, right? Uh, people in the administration, the, the, you know, as they're putting together a second term, might decide to, uh, you know, invite the vice president of Taiwan to the inauguration, which would, or the president of Taiwan to the inauguration. That would be a symbolic, you know, leap out of, you know, recent normality. Uh, uh, little things like that, you know, uh, you know, chest bumping, uh, diplomatic shoving, um, things like that would be, you know, risky. That could, you could, you could trick off another a response to that, not necessarily directed toward Taiwan, some other part of the world, and things would get out of hand. So it's, a, I mean, I consider the situation fragile, but not hopeless, right? Uh, I guess that's the best answer I can come up with not being an expert on Taiwan. Hi, Adam. Uh, we have another question that sort of posits an alternative scenario where Biden wins, right? Yeah. And in a Biden administration and, and the Democrats and the left, uh, as you point out, are more concerned about human rights violations. So the question asks, right, sort of under that scenario, sort of how do you think uh, China's actions and, and human rights violations in, in Xinjiang and, and, and Tibet would affect um, Sino-US relations under uh, a Biden administration? Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, uh, Joe Biden, um, I've known Joe Biden since 1977. I met him in 1977. And um, I have to be careful what I say. I do want him to win, but he's not my favorite democratic thinker. Let's put it that way. I don't think he's a, a genuine strategic thinker. I think he's a politically astute man who knows what people want to hear. Um, uh, but I don't think he's going to come up with a lot of bold and innovative foreign policy ideas. Uh, more important, I think, uh, Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken and other people who will be part of uh, the national security and aspects of the administration, if it comes to exist, right? They're making lists now of all the things that they want to do, all the things they want to rectify from the Trump years and all the new things they want to do. But, but the reality is, is that if Biden becomes president, he's going to face a series of very acute domestic crises for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next couple of years. And the bandwidth for foreign policy is going to be a lot narrower than people think. Uh, China is a large country. There are a lot of equities tied up with it. As I said, the U.S. government has multiple um, angles of, of incidents on looking at China. 
simply organizing the American government, you know, to deal effectively and coherently with China is a full-time job in a lot of cases. Um, it seems to me that, uh, just like with Jimmy Carter back in the day, uh, even if there is a democracy promotion, human rights rhetoric coming out of the of a Biden administration, I think there will be some, but, but more than Trump and more than Obama probably, because Biden will have to propitiate parts of the party that care about that. I don't think he's going to fall on his knife over human rights um, and stuff with respect to to, uh, to China. I mean, there are a lot more, you know, concrete security and economic interests involved that are going to take priority in any sober, um, uh, pragmatic uh, policy. Uh, and I think one of the things that the Biden administration will do, it will, it will restore a normal process to American foreign policy, which we haven't seen in three years. Um, you're going to have people in the State Department, in the Defense Department, in the intelligence community who are experienced and who understand these issues and actually know what they're doing. And there'll be an interagency again, and there'll be National Security Council meetings, and there'll be a kind of a regularization of the process. And that will help, I think, you know, keep um, all the various equities that U.S. policy uh, engages in China in some kind of balance. So unless the violations are really egregious and over the top, and produce, you know, banner headlines in American media, I don't think it's going to really, really elicit, you know, dramatic uh, reposts from the United States. Uh, the, the State Department will go back to, to issuing what we used to call demarchemallows. That's supposed to be, a, you know, a demarche is, when, is a French word for, you know, complaining about what some other country does, and we all know what a marshmallow is. So we used <laughs> to combine, uh, create a neologism, combine the term demarchemallow. It means you make a lot of noise, you issue a statement, but you're really, you're not going to fall on your knife over this kind of stuff. And that's what I think is liable to be the case. Um, uh, if the Chinese do something that's, you know, of the scale of what the, of the, of the Myanmar government did to, to the Rohingya, that could change things. Um, but absent that kind of, you know, really flagrant, uh, you know, mass murder kind of thing, uh, all at once kind of thing. I, I, I doubt that um, uh, the policy is going to hinge on human rights and um, democracy promotion kinds of issues. In, in the campaign so far, and, and, and there's been a sea change in the Democratic Party even before the, the campaign, uh, uh, the Democrats are not going to be, they're not going to go back to the old attitude that they had toward China uh, during the Obama period. They're not going to give the Chinese the benefit of the doubt. Uh, the, the, the Democrats have come off the, uh, the expectations of, you know, the stakeholder expectations and so forth. Uh, even Larry Summers, uh, who, when he was at the Treasury Department in the Clinton administration, along with, you know, Robert Rubin, created some of the conditions in the economic relationship that have given rise to the problems we have now, doesn't talk about the U.S.-China relationship today the way that he did in the 90s, okay? Uh, so if, if, if Larry Summers can change his mind and his rhetoric, it's pretty clear that the Democrats are not going to go back to the, you know, to the way things were during the Clinton period the convergence idea. So I, I, I don't know that we're going to see a whole lot of difference really in practical terms over trade or over uh, geopolitical issues um, between um, uh, the Trump administration at its best and it's not often at its best and a Biden administration. What'll be, what'll be different is the tone will be different. It'll be more professional. It'll be more sober. Um, and there will be a, a professional process, a foreign policy process that will keep the, again, keep the various equities in some kind of a sensible balance. And you won't have the kind of monkey in the machine room um, episodes where the president or somebody in the Oval Office, like, like Mr. Navarro, sort of reaches down into the bureaucracy and kind of goes like this and messes up, messes up a policy that's been more or less consistent and understood and anticipated by others for years. Um, uh, a Biden administration is gonna be, would be a, a, a much more professional, tightly knit kind of normal administration in terms of process and that kind of unpredictable stuff is not going to happen. That, that's what that's what the difference would be, it seems to me. Hi, Adam. Um, I was wondering if I, I could follow up on, on that, right? Because last month, Politico reported that the, the, the Trump administration is mulling, calling, you know, what is happening in, in Xinjiang a, a, a genocide, right? And, and you yeah. know, call, calling it a genocide carries with it international legal obligation. Yeah, that's right. And just, and just yesterday, Pompeo has, has, has said that the administration is, is carefully calibrating, right, sort of what to call uh, the, the occurrences are, are in, in, mm -hmm. in Xinjiang. And if sort of, you know, before the, the, 
the end of, of, of the term, the Trump administration, administration calls it a genocide. Does that then lock in, you know, a, a, a potential sort of Biden administration and, and constrains what Biden is able to do uh, if it becomes president? It, it would to some extent. I mean, to the extent that, that, that uh, you know, the, the, the salon crowd, the Chatterati bought into that concept that it was in fact uh, some kind of, uh, they, that it, it fit the international legal definition of a genocide, it would raise the bar and lock in a successor administration to some extent, to some extent. But since um, serious people don't actually take very seriously uh, the, the uh, I mean, how is it possible to take seriously the moral pronouncements of an administration like the Trump administration, which doesn't even recognize the sanctity of contracts and the rule of law in the United States? So there's a certain lack of credibility, uh, especially if it comes this late in the administration during a political season, a, a lack of credibility in it. So I don't know that it would raise the bar all that much uh, on a, on a on an incoming administration. But it, it, this is clearly politics. I mean, uh, as I've written before elsewhere, the United States hasn't really had a foreign policy for the past three, three and three quarter years. Uh, foreign policy issues have been used as props for domestic political signaling purposes. Every administration um, uh, combines politics and actual policy equities in its, in its foreign policy judgments, but there's never been an administration as just brazenly political and manipulative of foreign policy issues is this one. Um, so uh, it, it seemed pretty clear already, even before May 25th, before the George Floyd um, uh, era, you might call it, uh, came upon the United States, that uh, the Trump campaign was gonna be basically a hate China campaign. It was gonna be based largely on the virus, right? But on other other neuralgic issues that uh, uh, on on which there's more agreement across the political aisle nowadays than there there was four or five years ago. I mean, it's you know not everything that the Trump administration has done has been awful, uh, because not everything that it inherited was great. Um, there was a problem in the economic relationship with China, and Democratic administrations, uh, the previous Democratic administration and the Republican administration before that, was reluctant to take it on, and. Um, I could go into the reasons why, but we don't have time for that. Uh, uh, but it was, it turned out to be the Trump administration that saw for its own political benefit that it should be the administration that would, that sh would shake the cage and that would disrupt the status quo. And it needed to be disrupted. Uh, I'm just sorry that it was the Trump administration that did it. The, the administration has had a couple other good ideas, all right? For example, to emphasize in immigration policy, um, economic as opposed to humanitarian criteria for deciding on uh, who can become an American citizen, who can get an H-1 visa and so forth. Every other country in the world, you know, basically judges its immigration policy on the basis of economic need, not just on, on the basis of humanitarian uh, considerations. But the way that it was introduced, <laughs> right, uh, was of a piece with, you know, uh, you know, the racism and the xenophobia that underlies, you know, the body language of the, this is an administration who, who in Charlottesville in the summer of, in the summer of 2017, referred to people who, who gathered under a Nazi flag as some fine people, right? So, <laughs> I mean, it's possible to do the right thing for the for the for the wrong reasons and in the, you know in the wrong with the wrong body language. So again, with the China policy, something needed to be done. I'm just so sorry it had to be it had to be Donald Trump that did anything. Uh, but really, nobody's gone back to the way things were, um, you know, before. Um, and so I I mean I just don't think uh, 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 you know a Biden administration would not roll over for the Chinese. No way. Uh, and, and you can see it in the rhetoric, the rhetoric of the, the campaign. They're trying to keep up, you know, hawkish remark for hawkish remark uh, with with the Trump guys. And so when Pompeo talks about genocide and who knows what he's going to, you know, they might, they, you know, they might start a war with Iran for all I know in the next in the next 25 or 30 days. All this is politics. I mean, these these guys will do anything to save their political posterior if they think they're in danger of losing the election. They will start a war. Um, if they think that's what the, that's what the, everything these these people are utterly transactional, they instrumentalize everything. Uh, there, it's very odd. Last thing I want to say about it, you know, <clears throat> uh, last time I did a webinar, uh, RSIS webinar, I made some remarks about about uh, critical theory, and uh, uh, I uh, I pointed out that uh, the, the 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 stipulated human nature that lies at the bottom of the sort of neo-Marxist thinking is that 
uh, political life is only conflictual. It's always zero sum. Human nature has only a conflictual and a competitive aspect, doesn't have a cooperative aspect. Now, the odd paradoxical thing is that uh, that's, the, that's the attitude on the left. That's also the attitude on the right. Both of, both of the extremes right now in, in, along the American political spectrum are pre-enlightenment. They don't appreciate the signal concept of the Enlightenment, which is that cooperative, positive sum relationships among individuals in a society and among society is not only possible, but uh, can be constructed and can be, can be built and can be sustained. That's the key idea of the Enlightenment. We now have political forces at the extremes uh, in American politics that, that deny that. That, that believe that all relationships are just zero sum, just, I mean, uh, the Trump administration is Randian to the core, right? <laughs> so this is quite ironic. I mean, the, the extremes have a lot more in common than they will admit. Uh, the rest of the, what I consider sane, pragmatic centrist, people who still affirm enlightenment principles on which every single American political institution is based, by the way, <laughs> we feel like we're the ones right now um, being besieged by the by the extremes, and all of this is of course exacerbated by the by the clickbait nature of the uh, of the news, which is all you know led you know it's shaped by social media, um, and uh, a, a lot of the disruption, a lot of the conspiracy theory is a direct is a direct uh, uh, result of the the dramatic shift in the way that Americans get their news and think about news. I mean the very the very core of a common sense of what reality is has been has been has been vitiated. By, uh, by the technology. It's a very serious problem. I would recommend, if people don't know about it yet, there's a new, um, relatively new documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma about the, the impact of the technology on American politics and on, on democracy. I would urge everybody, take a look at it. Um, if you haven't been following this issue, this will be quite stimulating and interesting to people, I think. Um, so that's where we are, really. Uh, uh, I never, I mean, I never thought in, in, I mean, I'm almost, I'll be 70 my next birthday. I never thought I would see the wheels come off of American institutions um, the way they have, as fast as they have over the past couple of, couple of months. Never thought I'd see anything like it. Um, a lot of people are in denial about it. A lot of people overseas are in denial about it. They just can't believe it's happening. They just don't want to believe it's happening. But trust me, it's happening. So when you talk about you know uh, ideology and nationalism in the Sino-American relationship, it sounds very antiseptic. It sounds like a you know a really typical sort of academic subject that you would have a seminar on. But it's the context that's so weird right now, especially in the United States, but not you know not just the United States. It's the context that makes what would what would be what would be a normal discussion, a normal academic discussion, uh, tinged with abnormality. It's the context that is so unprecedented and so strange. It makes it hard to, you know, to be confident about any projection when it comes to answers to questions like these. It makes it very hard to be confident. Thank you, Adam. Um, we are just about out of time. And, and on, on behalf of, of RSIS, um, I would like to thank you for your very interesting presentation and, and for, for all your time. And Dear viewers, also thank you for, for your participation and, and all your very interesting questions. I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't get to uh, all your questions, but uh, we hope to see you. Uh, uh, Dr. Garfinkel is, is scheduled to give two more webinars. Uh, right. So keep a lookout for the, uh, the, the email and we hope that you will be able to, to join us in the subsequent webinars. All right, again, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adrian, excellent moderation. Appreciate it. Okay. Great questions, by the way. Great questions. Have a good night, Adam.